We're ready. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another Thursday night program. You're here with the Adams County Historical Society. Um, we appreciate you coming out every Thursday. My name is Abby Huffman. I am Director of Programs with the Adams County Historical Society. And tonight we have another great speaker for you. I know you're going to be excited. Usually we talk about Gettysburg or Adams County history. Those are kind of two of our um, sweet topics. Um, but tonight we're going to do a little bit more Civil War history and talk a little bit about Antietam, the Battle for Sharpsburg. And what I really find is interesting is when we focus on the civilians during the battle here in Gettysburg, the civilians down in Antietam, I'm sure we're going through very similar things. So it's cool to be able to branch out a little bit. And if you like these videos, I would encourage you to like, comment, and subscribe here. If you put any comments down below, our speaker tonight will be able to answer those for you after the program. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Steve Cowie, who is our speaker for this evening. Steve, I'll have you take it away. Thanks so much, Abby. I'm honored to present to the Adams County Historical Society, and I'm here to talk about my new book, which investigates the Battle of Antietam and its impact on the community of Sharpsburg, Maryland. It's, uh, it's a passion project that, that took me 15 years to research and another three years to write. And it's based on a number of, of different primary sources, including uh, congressional cases and war claims that I located at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Um, these claims documents, about 3,000 pages in total, uh, contained a trove of new information about Antietam's impact on the community. And it really... Uh, kind of resurrects, if you will, a lot of these stories and hardships that have been lost to time, uh, focusing on dozens of families that li lived on and off the battlefield. Uh, the structure of this presentation is going to be similar uh, to that of my book. I'm going to take you all from the battle's prelude through the bloody fighting on September 17th, the battle proper, uh, as well as the aftermath. And we're also going to examine the Army of the Potomac's six-week encampment after the battle, uh, during which time uh, the federal soldiers took a devastating amount of property from the community and spread deadly diseases as well. And last, I'm going to give you all a brief overview of the frustrating war claims process in which civilians of the Sharpsburg and Keatesville community pursued compensation from the government, uh, lasting for decades, this process did, uh, and it, uh, it stretched into the 1900s, all of which uh, related to damages and losses from the Battle of Antietam. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the content. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Sharpsburg, it's located about 40, 45 miles southwest of Gettysburg in western Maryland. Uh, it, it, it lies along, if you see on the left side of the screen right here, the Potomac River. I'm trying to use my mouse here to show you. Uh, this curving line here is the Potomac River. And then this tributary on the right side of the screen is Antietam Creek. Now, the 1860 federal census lists about 2,400 residents in Sharpsburg district, and that included 200 free persons of color, uh, and in addition, there were 150 slaves. The economic base of this community was, by and large, farming, and by early September, mid-September 1862, fall harvest was in full swing. Farmers and their hands and their slaves were focusing their energy on threshing wheat, the golden grain, a vital cash crop to this community. And they were also threshing in smaller quantities, rye and oats. And they were moving giant tons of cured hay, Timothy hay and clover hay inside of barns to serve as, uh, as winter feed for their animals. And also these, these farmers were preparing to harvest acres and acres of nearly ripe potatoes and apples and corn. All of these agricultural products I've described were crucial to one's annual income, and they also provided food for families and livestock. So in many regards, uh, this, this time here in mid-September, was what, it was the worst possible timing for an interruption of farming, if we want to look at it that way. Uh, but then came Antietam. It's going to take a little while to to explain the Maryland campaign in this presentation. So if it's all right, I'd like to just fast forward and bring you all up to September 15th, 1862, when the armies arrived in the Antietam Valley and about 120,000 soldiers smothered farms in the Sharpsburg and Keatesville area. 
And for two days, General George McClellan, commanding the Army of the Potomac for the United States, made preparations to attack General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Now, these two days of preparations were not quiet. In fact, the cannonading on September 16th, uh, after the fog lifted that morning, was incredibly violent. And that followed in the late afternoon of the 16th uh, with sharp skirmishing just north of Sharpsburg on what we now know as the northern part of the Antietam battlefield. Up until this time, the community of Sharpsburg had not hosted Civil War combat, so this artillery fire and musketry scared the daylights out of people, and it forced many families, dozens of them, to flee their homes and seek shelter in distant locations along the Potomac River, like caves and canal lock houses and farmsteads along the Potomac. But there were a number of citizens that uh, that didn't go anywhere in the town of Sharpsburg except for a few steps down. They went into the basements and the cellars of brick and home dwellings to uh, to try their luck at weathering the impending storm. And these cellars, they were quite cramped. According to the deposition of one resident who lived on Main Street in Sharpsburg, he, uh, he testified in a claims case that there were 75 people in his basement from September 15th through the 18th. Now, in the early morning of September 17th in the pre-dawn hours, the uh, the Battle of Antietam began. And I'm not going to give you a tactical overview of the fighting, but I will emphasize that this combat, this tornado of destruction raged across farmsteads and crop fields and woodlots. This was land where people lived where they worked and where they worshipped. And this, this just absolute horrible fighting in 12 hours culminated in what we now know as the bloodiest single day in American military history. There were roughly 23,000 men killed, wounded, captured, or missing. And the carnage was gruesome uh, based on all, all kinds of accounts from soldiers and civilians alike. To give you one example, there was a young lady that lived on the battlefield. Her name was Mary Ellen Piper. She lived in the Piper farm, for those of you who are familiar with Antietam. And uh, when, when she came home, she came across such horrid sights. She described the, these images in a letter to a friend just about two and a half weeks after the battle. And she wrote, you could have walked five miles and not been off the battlefield. No tongue can tell, nor pen describe the horrors. Now, much of this carnage was caused by 500, 520 pieces of artillery that were engaged on September 17th. And this destructive fire killed countless soldiers and damaged a number of buildings as well. What we see on the left of the screen right here is the Dunker Church. Uh, in one of these walls, a soldier estimated there was a cannonball hole so wide that a man could walk through it. And off to the right, we see the barn of Samuel and Sarusha Real. Uh, this is located just opposite of where the Antietam Battlefield's Visitor Center now stands. And uh, this, this is also evidence of the fact that shells were not limited to the boundaries of the battlefield. In fact, hundreds of shells missed their marks and sailed east of Antietam Creek and west of the Confederate line. And what we see on the right-hand screen, this real barn, uh, there were actually two brothers that lived on adjoining farms. Samuel's brother, David, lived just south of this farm, and both brothers lost their barns to fire. And inside those buildings, they had all their hay crop from the summer, dried kindling that sparked and raged into an, an inferno. And the buildings burned so quickly, destroying all the equipment and farm farming tools inside of them. They burned so quickly that the Confederate wounded who were sheltering in these structures, many of them could not be evacuated in time and reportedly burned to death. There's also the account of the Muma farmstead. Samuel and Elizabeth Muma's farm was located in the middle of the battlefield, and Confederates intentionally set fire to their stately farmhouse to prevent federal marksmen from occupying the building, and artillery projectiles struck the Muma's barn and two outbuildings, destroying those structures completely. Also, artillery fire plunged into the town of Sharpsburg on September 16th and 17th. It was especially 
terrible during the battle. But what we're seeing here in these images on the slides is what is what is known as Sharpsburg Heights. And just beyond this camera position to the east were Confederate batteries that drew the fire from the Federal Reserve artillery across Antietam Creek. And these federal shells fell into the town of Sharpsburg based on countless primary sources. Uh, dozens of these buildings and stores and churches were hit by shells, and many of them caught fire. Uh, in fact, there were two barns, according to the war claims, that burned to the ground. They were located in the middle of the town of Sharpsburg near the public square. And there were also two dwelling houses owned by widows Margaret Shackelford and Sarah Himes. Now, when we go through the land records and the census record, it tells us clearly that these two dwellings were the only properties that the widows owned in September 1862. And thus the destruction by the fires uh, rendered these ladies and their children homeless. But it's important to also remember that, that many of these people who were hunkered in their cellars during the battle, they experienced absolute terror with the missiles exploding overhead and crashing into these structures with all these people trapped in the basement. And this depiction, this sketch right here is that of the, uh, the cellar of John and Susan Kretzer and their daughter Teresa gave an account in her later years. She was describing how, how this uh, cellar was filled with all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of people of all classes and all ages. And she wrote in her recollections, Every time the firing began extra hard, the babies would cry and the dogs would bark. Occasionally, a woman was quite unnerved and hysterical, and some of those old aged men would break out in prayer. As the sun set on September 17th, structure fires throughout the area colored the night sky an eerie shade of red. A newspaper correspondent who was at Sharpsburg at this time, he wrote, Near the town, haystacks, barns, and houses are in flames. All the country is flaming, smoking, and burning, as if the last great day, the judgment day of the Lord, had come. Another way that Antietam impacted the community was field hospitals. There were roughly 17,000 men wounded at Antietam. Now, many of these injured Confederates left with Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army when they withdrew across the Potomac River on the evening of September 18th. But a conservative estimate might suggest there were at least 12,000 more wounded left just in the sharpsburg Keatesville vicinity in the immediate aftermath of Antietam. And the number of these wounded far outnumbered the available structures in this sparsely populated community. Subsequently, the medical departments in both armies had no choice to, but to commandeer every property in the area for hospital purposes. And when all these residents emerged from their evacuation sites and their cramped cellars and they returned to their own homes, many of these people found their dwellings overflowing with mangled, bleeding, wounded, and hospital surgeons performing grisly operations and amputations inside their homes. And because of this overcrowding, I found it interesting in, in this research that uh, there were there were several dozen families that were turned away by the surgeons because there was no room for them in their own homes. They were asked to find shelter elsewhere. And this displacement varied. But for some families, they had to find temporary shelter for several weeks and in some cases, several months. Uh, those families that were allowed to stay were often consolidated into one or two rooms, which proved to be quite crowded for those couples that had six, seven, or eight children. But these inconveniences paled in comparison to what was the true emergency. There was a medical supply crisis immediately during and after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, it's, it's proven and substantiated in the 1862 reports of the U.S. Sanitary Commission and also the after action report of Dr. Jonathan Letterman, the medical director of the Army of the Potomac, that supplies were an issue until they began to trickle into the area on September 21st. And even then, uh, those stores and supplies that arrived were woefully insufficient to remedy the emergency at hand. So in, in between the battle on the 17th and the 21st, uh, these medical personnel had no choice but to enter Sharpsburg's homes and take anything they could get for hospital purposes. 
And when we go through all the lists and inventories of losses for, from these claims, again, I found 250 claims at the National Archives. So I had a lot of material to access for these uh, samples that I pulled for this book. And when we look through uh, for clothing, we see a pattern for countless families who lost every stitch of wardrobe, not just for the husband and the wives, but for their children as well. All these fabrics and shirts and pants and blouses were torn into bandages for the mangled sufferers. The same went for bedding. Uh, beds were taken from houses as well as blankets and quilts and coverlids, sheets and pillowcases. These folks were so desperate for supplies, they even took carpeting from the homes and window blinds and tablecloths. It was a terrible situation. And in order for these uh, hospital uh, personnel to cook and feed the wounded, their wagon supplies were stranded distant from Sharpsburg. Some of these wagons were still in Frederick, Maryland, and these these army cooks and uh, uh, personnel, they had they had they had no utensils for this. So again, we see the pattern in the war claims where entire kitchens were just emptied and gutted for hospital use, uh, pots and pans, buckets and basins, plates and silverware, you name it, it was gone. And it wasn't returned or paid for based on the allegations by the civilians. So one can only imagine the thoughts of these residents when they finally re regained occupancy of their homes and found their many of their furnishings just gone. But instead of becoming irate, the evidence shows that it was actually to the contrary. Uh, these people saw the emergency firsthand. They could see that these thousands of patients needed immediate care. And so the civilians of Sharpsburg and Keatesville pitched into the crisis to help. Uh, with whatever food they had left, they baked bread, they made soup. Some of these farmers willingly slaughtered their own livestock. And there were depositions of several men in the community who voluntarily took their horses, their four horse teams and wagons, all the way to Hagerstown, 12 miles distant, getting up at four in the morning and paying the Hagerstown Pike toll fees out of their own pocket to search for supplies for these desperate surgeons. And while volunteering on the front lines, these civilians saw some of the just absolutely horrible, uh, nightmarish wounds, graphic, gruesome wounds of all kinds, uh, uh, all types. And uh, the only way really to put it into words, I'll leave it. I won't go into all the, the gory details that I have in the book, but I'll leave it with one quote by a hospital volunteer who wrote, the name of Antietam is ever associated in my mind with scenes of horror. So... I skipped this slide. I'm new to this. Uh, these virtual presentations. Bear with me. But this this sketch here shows uh, just a depiction of some uh, local civilians uh, volunteering their services at Antietam's field hospitals. And as I skip forward again, it's important to note that hospital staff they weren't the only ones entering people's homes during and after the battle because straggling was a terrible problem at Antietam for both armies. And the claims tell us that these, these folks, these civilians lost all kinds of personal items like gold and jewelry, family photographs, uh, Bibles, musical instruments. Uh, soldiers broke into safes and carried off stuff. And they also vandalized, intentionally just, just broke up some of the homes and you know shattered mirrors just for their own spite or enjoyment. Describing the Confederate thefts, one local townsman in the town of Sharpsburg, he wrote just three weeks after the battle, they entered several poor people's homes and robbed them of everything they had in this world. Two thirds of the families in the place had nothing but the clothes on their backs. But war claims allege that Union soldiers also plundered homes. And these uh, depredations became so widespread that General McClellan issued on October 1st, 1862, General Order Number 159 that addressed the stragglers and pillagers wreaking havoc and lawlessly depredating upon the civilians. Now, the heavy losses from stragglers and uh, medical personnel cast many residents into troubled circumstances, especially those of lesser means. I'll give you one quote by the wife of a tenant farmer who lived just north of the battlefield of Antietam. And she wrote that after the battle, the Union troops came on the farm and took everything we had and ruined us. I know we lost all we had. 
McClellan's general order brought many Union soldiers back into line, but the Army of the Potomac continued taking property from the community, and here's why. When we look at campaigns like uh, and battles like Gettysburg in 1863 and Monocacy in 1864, the armies fought and soon left those areas after the combat ceased, leaving their, their wounded and their medical personnel behind. But at Antietam, after the Confederate Army left Maryland on the evening of September 18th, the Army of the Potomac remained in this area for six weeks. And I'll give you an idea of what Sharpsburg looked like at this time. Now, General McClellan sent two of his corps down to Harper's Ferry. But what he did was, when the Confederates left Maryland, he stretched his army in a defensive web along the Potomac River, all the way from Williamsport, north of Sharpsburg, down to Harper's Ferry, south of Sharpsburg. Most of these forces were encamped within a five-mile radius of Sharpsburg and the Antietam battlefield for those six weeks. And what we see, um, unless you can't see it on the map here, I'm going to try to find my mouse. I'm circling the town of Sharpsburg right here, and all this area was roughly that of the Antietam battlefield. Uh, this this area was completely overrun by federal soldiers during this time. And what we what we see in the official records, known as the OR, is that on October 1st, 1862, there were 75,000 men and officers present for duty just in this area you see on this map, this five-mile radius. At that time... One environmental study estimated that there were more people concentrated near Sharpsburg then than in cities like Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, Detroit, or Washington, D.C. But the difference is, is that those big cities had systems and networks in place to supply their large populations. Sharpsburg, what we're seeing on this map, it was a rural farming community that did not even have a railroad depot in 1862. And worse, Confederates earlier in the Maryland campaign sabotaged the Army of the Potomac supply lines. They burned the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Bridge at Monocacy Junction. They tapped the CNO Canal in several places south of Sharpsburg, and they destroyed two bridges at Harper's Ferry. Well, this sabotage, it, it really disrupted supplies from reaching McClellan's army. And until the War Department could circuitously establish depots in Hagerstown and Frederick, the Army of the Potomac, what you're seeing on this map, they officially used Sharpsburg, unofficially I should say, as their emergency supply depot. Because when we see in the war claims, it didn't just affect the shortage. It didn't just affect the medical department. McClellan's commissary and quartermaster departments were also impacted by the shortage. And to give you an example of some of the commissary uh, items taken from the community, the, these allegations are just rife in, in dozens and dozens and dozens of these civilian war claims that they lost all of their food. And this this is also supported by a newspaper article, and, and the Hagerstown uh, local newspaper reported just two and a half weeks after the battle, what our people will do to obtain food for man and beasts during the approaching winter, God alone only knows. And that newspaper ran that article because at that time, the food supply was essentially gone from the Antietam Valley. Uh, soldiers ravaged vegetable gardens and apple orchards, potato patches. They went into smokehouses and carried off all types of cured meats like shoulders and hams and bacon. They descended into the cellars of civilians' homes and walked away with flour and preserves and salt and sugar, anything that they could use and eat. These soldiers carried off. And sadly, the, the trend that appears throughout these claims is none of these items were taken with permission and none of them were paid for. These civilians received not a penny for their food. I'll give you another example. Livestock. These, uh, in a sample, this is a conservative estimate, but in a sample of war claims from September 15th, 1862 through the end of October, the... Uh, the citizens of the Sharpsburg area accused McClellan soldiers of slaughtering 1,600 head of livestock, cattle, sheep, and swine, along with about 3,000 chickens and turkeys and geese. Uh, one of these uh, farmers uh, gave a quote in his war claim. He testified that uh, 
that these officers came to him and told him after the battle, the officer said their wagon supplies had not come up. They were out of rations and they must have food for themselves. The officers offered no payment for these animals and a farmhand later testified, I was with Mr. Poffenberger at the time they were taken. He was so distressed that he could not eat. Humans were not the only ones in need of food after the battle. Because when we look at the OR, the official records for October 1st, 1862, the Army of the Potomac had somewhere between 16,000 and 20,000 horses and mules attached to the Army just in that five-mile radius that I showed you on the previous map. Uh, these animals all needed large amounts of daily forage to survive, and so it's no surprise when you look through the dozens of war claims that these citizens claim the loss of their entire fall harvest of all types of grains and corn and the like. Uh, an estimate that I'll give you, it's another conservative sample, but I tallied up all these numbers by hand. It, uh, it was a tedious process, but I wanted to know the total myself. So from September 15th through the end of October, a sample of war claims accused the Army of the Potomac's animals of uh, consuming and destroying more than 4,000 tons of wheat and hay, corn and corn fodder and rye and oats. Uh, one resident who lived just south of the town of Sharpsburg, he testified that all the products on his farm disappeared like frost before a burning sun. The losses I have just described, are, are they're, they're the tip of the iceberg. Uh, soldiers took dozens of horses and mules from citizens in the community uh, without offering any permission or payment. Uh, the soldiers stripped farms and roadways of all types of fencing to use the rails as firewood in their camps. Uh, this left sections of Sharpsburg a vast and unrecognizable plain because the soldiers so desperate for firewood, they were even yanking and pulling the locust posts out of the ground. And the absence of all this fencing was not only unnerving to residents, but disorienting when they were trying to find their way home in the darkness. The, the lack of markings for these farm lanes uh, proved to be quite confusing for a number of residents, sadly. Um, but uh, there were also a number of hardwood trees, thousands of them, if you can believe that, destroyed after the Battle of Antietam by McClellan's soldiers. And these uh, these trees were split into logs to use as firewood in camps, especially as the uh, temperatures became quite chilly throughout late October. But the soldiers also used these logs to make huts. They made log shelters all along the Potomac River just to provide warmth for themselves. So... These losses, all these combined losses threw families into catastrophic circumstances because, for example, without horses and mules, how are these farmers supposed to work their land or haul their grains, what was left of their grains, uh, to the market to sell? And without fencing, which was extremely expensive and laborious to replace, how could farmers protect future crops from foraging wildlife? In many regards, all these losses that you see on this screen, though, uh, they paled into comparison to, to what would come. And that was a deadly disease outbreak that raged across the area. Uh, we have to look at the ecological conditions that were abysmal after the battle. Uh, hundreds of dead army horses lay and rotted on the field uh, throughout late October. Uh, there were piles of amputated limbs just thrown outside of these uh, field hospitals. Uh, that they were the surgeons were so desperate to perform all these amputations they didn't have time to burn or bury the appendages right away. Uh, we also have to consider that there were latrine sinks filled with the waste of seventy five thousand soldiers, and of course, uh, sadly, we had thousands of of graves thousands of graves, uh, sh and many of these remains were shallowly buried. So when you take all these uh, unpleasant factors into account, the stench throughout the area was just nauseating. And interestingly, who visited Sharpsburg during this time? President Abraham Lincoln. Accounts show that he toured the Antietam battlefield and witnessed this desolation and stench firsthand. But his thoughts to uh, the carnage and the, and the foul sights and smells are lost to time. 
But nonetheless, when we consider all these unhealthy contaminants uh, polluting the groundwater of Sharpsburg and attracting swarms of flies, it's no surprise that a public health crisis erupted in McClellan's camps and hospitals and spread to the civilians as well. And this disease outbreak uh, primarily included typhoid fever, diarrhea, and dysentery. Um, now, in my book, I go into a ton of detail about Antietam's disease outbreak, and, and much, of my, much of the evidence is based on uh, the day books of this man that you see on the screen. His name was Dr. Augustine A. Biggs, and he was Sharpsburg's town doctor uh, during and after the war. And he made daily house calls in which he logged the date and all the names of his patients and the medicines dispensed. And I don't profess to be a, uh, a, a medical expert by any means, but when you begin investigating all the various uh, treatments that he administered to these patients, we see that they all related in some shape or form to typhoid fever, diarrhea, and dysentery to match the accounts coming from the hospital, the army hospitals, and the camps throughout Sharpsburg. Um, we don't know how many civilians died during this outbreak, but I did review and compare Biggs data to burial records and death records in Washington County, Maryland from 1850 to 1870. And what we see in Biggs Daybook and in the death records is a chilling spike from late September 1862, lasting through about mid-December 1862. The numbers didn't return to normal until about May the following year. But if we had to look um, in some in some in some way, shape or form, Biggs is his patient load quadrupled during part of this stretch uh, and the burials in some of these graves quadrupled. I'm sorry. in some of these graveyards were about four times their average as well. One civilian put the epidemic into perspective uh, and described how his granddaughters became infected with typhoid fever and how disease took the life of his brother as well. This civilian uh, was Jacob Miller, Squire Jacob Miller, and he wrote in late 1862 to a relative, many other citizens and hundreds of soldiers have been taken with the same, and many died. It is an army disease, thus adds an addition to the horrors of war. And that brings us to the final part of my research, uh, the war claims and congressional cases. Uh, this process consisted of three phases, the Act of July 4, 1864, the Bowman Act of 1883, and the Tucker Act of 1887. All three of these acts were divided into two parts, merits, which investigated the facts of a case, and loyalty, which investigated a claimant's political leanings during the war. Now, this, uh, this process began for Sharpsburg's residents with the Act of July 4, 1864, also known as the July 4th Act, and it empowered Quartermaster General Montgomery C. Meigs to dispatch special agents from his Quartermaster Department to the Sharpsburg area to investigate the claims and tour the affected properties and interview claimants and their witnesses. This July 4th Act presented a number of problems to claimants. Uh, for example, there were there were numerous families teetering on economic ruin after the Antietam campaign and after the Civil War. They needed to be compensated for their losses. They were wiped out of, of all their products, uh, and, and some of these farmers were prevented from farming in 1863 uh, for a variety of reasons. Unfortunately, though, the investigations of the July 4th Act did not begin for these Sharpsburg, Keatesville area residents until the mid-1870s. By then, Congress had inserted a number of clauses into the July 4th Act that further limited what petitioners could claim, and that included theft and depredations, uh, any damages caused by hospital occupation or use, um, as well as anything related to the Confederate Army. I'm going to spotlight the destroyed farmstead of Samuel and Elizabeth Muma. Again, we touched on this earlier in the presentation, but Confederates during the Battle of Antietam set fire to the farmhouse and artillery shells, we don't know which army fired them, allegedly destroyed the Muma's barn and outbuildings as well. Well, the Act of July 4th did not allow any damages related to combat. So regardless of whether Confederates or Federals were responsible for this destruction, 
the War Department and the United States Treasury was not going to give the Muma family a penny because that's how it worked. Any any damages caused by marching or fighting across crop fields, it didn't count because the War Department considered this the ravages, sorry, the ordinary ravages of war. And for those people that didn't understand why they couldn't be compensated for damages to their uh, buildings from hospital use, for example, two two churches in Sharpsburg had to be raised after the battle. They were they were just not fit for worship anymore because the destruction was so bad because of hospital use. They couldn't recoup anything because, as the War Department explained, it was the misfortune of the claimants if they happened to have lived in the vicinity of a major battle. So if things weren't already difficult for petitioners, the Act of July 4 required them to furnish very specific evidence, such as the names of federal officers responsible for appropriating the supplies. And when when applicable, uh, these civilians were asked to provide those officers postal addresses as well. Uh, they needed to provide certified vouchers, which the quartermaster uh, officers at Antietam, for one reason or another, did not issue to the residents. And we know this because the third auditor of the Treasury in these war claims investigation tasked his clerks to go through all the accounts and returns of federal officers of the Army of the Potomac in September and October 1862. And I, I, uh, I went through uh, one by one, I went through 127 July 4th claims that I copied at the National Archives, and there was only one instance, one receipt found in these searches by the third auditor of the Treasury. Without all this paperwork, these claimants faced an uphill battle, receiving a penny from the government to prove that their losses were valid. And worse, the July 4th Act did not allow claimants to cross-examine witnesses or read the final reports of the quartermaster agents before they were sent to Washington. You may, you as a claimant may have produced all the favorable evidence proving your merits and loyalty, uh, but all it took was one incriminating statement, truthful or not, uh, to give the quartermaster agent reason to call for the rejection of your entire claim, especially if somebody in the community called you disloyal. So as a result, General uh, Quartermaster General Meigs rejected well more than half of the claims that I reviewed for the July 4th Act. And of those petitioners who received any settlements, it constituted on average about 15% of the total amount claimed. Understandably, folks were outraged at this outcome. They felt they had provided solid proof uh, to deserve full compensation from the government for their losses. And, and, and this anger wasn't limited to Sharpsburg. Hundreds of claimants throughout the northern and border states felt cheated by the rules of the July 4th Act and the outpouring of complaints for state representatives to take action. And as a result, Congress passed in 1883 the Bowman Act and in 1887 the Tucker Acts. Now, these latter acts shifted the jurisdiction of claims to the United States Court of Claims, and they empowered and they empowered the U.S. Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney General to send assistant attorneys to the Sharpsburg area to interrogate claimants and their witnesses. Now, a lot of these depositions, they were pretty juicy. There was some interesting pushback between the claimants and, and these slick attorneys from, from the U.S. Department of Justice. Claimants came armed with professional surveys of their properties showing, you know, uh, certified measurements of their fence lines and their, and, and their timber tracks, their crop fields, their haymows. But the attorneys argued back that uh, this evidence wasn't valid enough to warrant a settlement. Ultimately, what happened was the the Court of Claims and 65 Bowman and Tucker Act cases I reviewed, the Court of Claims awarded settlements to roughly one half of all the petitioners. And of those uh, settlements, uh, the claimants received about one half of what they were seeking. So these settlements, uh, they they were more lenient than the July 4th Act. They were they the people made out better with their settlements, but there was a drawback because half of the people didn't receive anything. And also these cases dragged from the 1880s into the 1900s. Uh, by then, uh, many of the claimants had died and their, their cases were hinging on the memories of any surviving witnesses, such as spouses or children or former employees. Uh, the last cases that I reviewed for this study, if you can believe this, they were settled in the year 1915, 
53 years after the battle. I'll close with a quote by one of the witnesses in these late cases. Um, she uh, she was one of many who, whose memory came under attack by these uh, by these United States assistant attorneys. Uh, her name was Angeline Jackson. And in September 1862, she was a 17 year old domestic servant uh, living and working on the farm of Captain David Smith, located just west of the town of Sharpsburg. In the year 1900, almost 40 years later, Angeline testified in Smith's Tucker Act case, and the attorneys were quizzing her left and right on what she could remember of these losses, uh, insinuating that she may not have um, memory to, to uh, you know, identify the names of officers or the number of bushels of wheat taken and so forth. But Miss Jackson, she put these attorneys in their place by giving a lengthy deposition, providing explicit details of how federal soldiers stripped Smith's farm bare. She named all the items. She was naming quantities as though it was yesterday. And she went off script at one point and she. Um, I'm going to pull up her quote because I want you all to hear this. It was pretty powerful to me. She went off script and she emphasized something to these attorneys that I think represents the memory of many civilians who, who experienced the, just the, the horrible misfortunes of Antietam. She stated, I remember all these things distinctly. It seems to have been burned into my mind, and I shall remember it as long as I can remember anything. And that concludes my presentation. I, uh, I would like to thank you all very much, sincerely, for taking your time to, to watch and listen. And uh, before I sign off, I'd like to make my publisher happy just by briefly mentioning where you can buy the book in case you're interested. Uh, it's available on the website of the publisher, Savis Beatty, and it's also available on Amazon. Uh, I'll now turn the program back over to Abby, and I'll, I, I thank you all very much, sincerely, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was incredible. I loved how you walked us through. Um, no one thinks about like we always and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it as much as the next person. We always talk in in Gettysburg about Civil War history, but we never think much about the civilians, especially outside of these smaller battles, not just in Gettysburg, which is a huge focal point. Um, but there are so many civilians affected all across the country. Um, you, you, and you never get to hear much about the damage claims. So I found that Fascinating. Thank you so much for your insight on that. And thank you to all the listeners out there who um, spent time with us this evening or whenever you're watching this. Um, thank you for supporting the Adams County Historical Society. Um, feel free, of course, to buy Steve's book, which is incredible. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to help us with these programs and our projects coming going forward, um, I would um, strongly recommend that you do that. You can become a member, which is um, listed down below. But I do want to thank you all so much for coming this evening and we will see you next week for another program again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Abby.